Ufuk, Mind the Gap. Now, you said in the film you want to interact with brilliant minds in Germany. If, if we speaking very, very strictly, one might say you technically are a brilliant mind from Germany because you were born here. Um, that's correct. Uh, I was born in Germany uh, in 1980. Uh, my parents used to live in Germany. And uh, when I was five, uh, they moved uh, to Turkey. So my memories uh, from Germany is from my kindergarten and uh, not always the fun ones. Um, but uh, so uh, Germany and the German culture has always been part of the family, to be honest. Uh, my, I remember my dad used to always say, this is how it's been done in Germany. You have to do it this way, that way type of, you know, warnings. <laughs> so we had the German discipline in the family. <laughs> All right. In your own words, in one sentence, what is the core question you're working on in your research? So uh, when we look uh, around the globe, ob obviously we observe massive in income differences across countries. And this income differences didn't occur overnight. Uh, obviously, today's rich countries managed to grow for many, many subsequent years. And that's how they managed to become so rich. So then the question is, why did some countries grow faster than others? And from the literature, indeed, the Nobel Prize was given uh, to Paul Romer for, for this argument. We know that in the long run, countries can grow differently only if they innovate more. So as a result, the question becomes, why do some countries innovate more than others? And this is exactly where my research comes in. So I try to really investigate in detail what are the sources of innovation? Why do some countries innovate more than others? And, uh, and I try to uh, do my research in a systematic fashion by focusing on firms' incentives, because firms are investing in R&D at the end of the day, but the firms are also hiring brilliant minds, right? They are hiring the in, in engineers, the inventors. Who are those engineers and who are those inventors? So in, innovation truly matters. Now, to, to figure out what matters and what could be policy prescriptions again, it helps when you can try stuff out. So in many disciplines like chemistry or physics, they have their CERN or they have a chemistry lab. What's the equivalent of a laboratory for an economist? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, obviously, we want to do some counterfactual policy experiments, and unfortunately, we don't have the labs in the physical sense. So you would need 10 Germanys to try out 10 different <laughs> exactly. policy versions. Exactly. Okay. Or, or, we had two at some point. Well, or, alternatively, we can rely on economic theory. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly where the strength of economic theory comes in. And uh, so my goal uh, has been in my research to create a dialogue between empirical studies and theoretical studies. So if we can build a theoretical environment which mimics the German economy, where the firms in my model grow just like the German firms, for instance, or the individuals in my model behave just like the German entrepreneurs or inventors, now I have my laboratory. Now, in this world, I can do some policy experiments by... So, so let, me, let me, just to make sure I, I understand, it's a bit like, like in SimCity, the computer game. Yes, exactly. you, you build a computer model of, say, the economy of Germany. And once that runs in a stable fashion, you can play around with it. Exactly. 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, and see what happens. Excellent. Yes, okay. that's exactly how we are doing. By simply uh, choosing the parameters of this model, of, this, of these equations, we try to mimic exactly the German firms and German individuals and entrepreneurs, so that when you simulate the model over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you can replicate what happened since the reunification, for instance. And that's exactly how we construct our own laboratory. Now, the other bit, which is truly novel, you go really deep down. You don't just take headline figures, GDP. You go to the micro level. So what does that make you? Are you a microeconomist <laughs> or are you a macroeconomist? Um, probably a little bit of both. Um, so I think one thing that uh, I realized uh, early on was that as a macroeconomist, if you just focus on one single number, you might be missing out a lot of interesting heterogeneity in the background. For instance, if you say that this country's GDP per capita is really high, does it mean that everybody in this economy is really well off? Or if an economy is really growing fast, does it mean that this is really a successful economy? Obviously, we have to go deeper and understand 
What happens to income inequality in the background? Do you give the equal chances to everybody in the society to express their creativity? Or is the wealth really getting concentrated by a smaller and smaller group in the economy, even though the GDP per capita might be growing fine, in the background, the inequality might be going up and up. In a dynamic sense, you might be digging a hole as an economy. So that's why going, starting from micro and looking at individuals becomes important. Okay, so I've learned two things. One, you have built a virtual laboratory for economics. Two, you've built a bridge between micro and macroeconomics. Let's look at results. Let's look at some maybe even policy prescription you now draw from running these repeated virtual experiments. You said Germany 30 years after a unification still has a wall. What do you mean speaking as economist? So uh, using the uh, using micro data from Germany uh, with colleagues from Halle, we created uh, some heat maps and our heat maps were was produced based on, for instance, GDP per capita or income mobility. You know, today you're in a certain position in the German income distribution. In 10 years, where are you going to be, for instance? Or when we look at the innovation per capita by looking at the patent per capita, or this is really, uh, I think, one of the most stark findings that we found so far is when you look at the innovation gap, there's a sizable gap between East and West. But when you even uh, within the inventors or within the high skilled people, when you look at the fraction of foreigners in that group, whatever, no matter which indicator you're looking at, you can draw the border between East and West Germany even today. So exactly. even though the physical uh, wall is not there, still we see an economic wall based on these indicators. So that the heat map for now is descriptive. And the good yeah. news is you get one and a half million euros to invest into more research. And in just a moment, we'll get uh, one of your partners on stage, Professor Grob, and we'll talk about how you will perform research on Germany, on the economy. But let's look at policy prescription maybe from other parts of the world. For example, India, you look closely at that economy. Right. Um, so when we, so typically, the, the typical approach for an economy, a developing economy like India is, oh, they are lacking money, so let's subsidize micro uh, entrepreneurs so that they can, they can grow and create jobs. But we did some detailed investigation, and indeed we found some very interesting results. So uh, from the literature, we know that one of the, you know, strongest predictor of firm size has to be the success of your business or success of your technology that you produced. But one of the strongest predictor of firm size in India is the size of the family. What? Or the to size be, of the family? To, to, be, to, be more, to be more precise, it's the number of male children uh, in India. So this is, this is a, a finding uh, from, uh, uh, from Nick Bloom and co-authors. And we took this fact and we looked at across regions in India and what we find is that in, in those parts of India where the trust on police force or judicial system is stronger, the correlation between firm size and family size is weaker, which means that if you rely on the system, then you start delegating to non-family members and you start growing your business. So in an environment where you cannot rely on outside uh, people, outside managers, if you cannot rely on, on the system, no matter how much R&D subsidy you're throwing at the firms, they're not going to grow. So you put, you put different versions of India through your model, and this is what Absolutely. dropped out. Trust is a surprisingly the core variable. Now, what might be recommendations, policy recommendations from that? So the, the immediate pol policy recommendation is, I think the policymakers has to depart from this one-sided view. You know, this, this, this problem is like a car with four broken tires. If you fix just one of them, it's not going to go. You have to really take an hol holistic approach. You know, you have to take it as a whole and then uh, approach the problem and fix each of these uh, problems simultaneously. Otherwise, you'll be just wasting taxpayers' money or, or international money on, on some programs that, that's not going to really achieve the ultimate goal. Which raises a lot of questions about programs we've seen over the last couple of decades from many international financial institutions. They might be looked at in a slightly harsher light once we use your modeling machine. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, I mean, through, through, through the lens of our, our analysis, we find quite some interesting policies which we typically think work beautifully. But when you look at the data, indeed, you don't see that. So all these people that, that spend these billions to prop up some economies and others not, 
Now you come along with your machine. Do they love you or do they hate you? We will see in the long run what happens. <laughs> um, so I think uh, so I, I I think we have to be patient, especially when we are talking about innovation. Innovation is not something that you can do overnight. Uh, that's typically the, the mistakes when we think about innovation. Let's throw money, and then suddenly next year we will start growing fast. But one has to go really to the bottom of this issue and and understand where these innovations are really coming from. And one one quick example that I want to give here is that, for instance, there is this common belief that R and D tax credit would work beautifully. You know, let's let's give R and D tax credit to two firms so that they can innovate more. But when we look at the data, we don't see a strong evidence of R&D tax credit working out. Then if at best it increases the wages of the, of the scientists or, or engineers, what's the problem? Well, the problem is each of these innovations or patents are coming from educated people. They are typically co coming from PhDs or master degrees, and they are fixed in supply today, right? So these are the people who are going to innovate. You're, you, you cannot stop somebody on the street and suddenly ask him or her to innovate, right? They have to go through education. Education takes time. So they have to do PhD. They have to gain experience. They have to start innovating. It's at least 10 years. If you press the button today and implement the policy today, you have to be patient to, to see the return. Ufo, so. We have a couple of parliamentarians here tonight. They might be <laughs> taking notes. Okay, scrapping R&D tax credit. That might be one of the takeaways from <laughs> R&D tax credit has to be combined with education policy. All right, Let perfect. Me. Here we go. And long term. <laughs> now, I, I resonate very much with what Professor Strat Stratman said. Mind the gap. Because tonight, I'll be flying back to London where I live. I'll read it on, on, the, curb, uh, on the platform of the tube. And I live in a country that a couple of years ago threw the question to its own people, what should our fate be in the EU, out of the EU, huge ramifications on the economic prospects of this country. Now you come along again and have a lot of data that your machine crunches, it comes up with insights. What should dictate economic policy? What should set economic policy? Insight from data or the will of the people? So, I think, uh, uh, again, it's a bit of both, or a lot of both. Uh, so, obviously, first, as a society, we have to set our objective functions, right? What, do we, what is it that we want to maximize? And that's going to come from, of course, the people, right? They are going to decide what we want to maximize. Once we set the goal, from that point on, we have to turn to the data and we have to ask, what kind of policies can bring us to that point. And we have enormous amount of data, especially with the digital revolution, we have collected a ton of data. They, they used to be in hard copies, now we are able to digitize these hard copies. And there are a lot of things from the past experiences that we can learn from. So as a result, bringing in more and more and more the past experiences and, and big data, then we can see better what would be the most efficient way of achieving this goal. So, so lots of similarities also, if you think back uh, to our conversation with Elliot, in both cases is both nature and nurture, and here micro and macro. Also, both of you did twin studies because you also work on the individual level, plus the question of unfolding. Same question to you, Ufuk. What helped you unfold over the course of your life, not just your academic life, to be the person you are now? Right. Um, through my uh, life, I traveled a lot to live. Uh, so first in Germany, then uh, for five years in my parents' hometown, and then I went to a boarding school in Ankara for seven years, and then I went to college in Istanbul, then to Boston, five years, Philadelphia, Already Chicago. Mm -hmm. So a lot of traveling. And all these travels allowed me to, to interact with people. And everybody has a different experience. Everybody has something different to teach you. So as a result, I benefited a lot from interacting with people from different backgrounds. But this is just my own story. Then, motivated by this experience, we went to the data and asked, do inventors who interact more with others and who work more with wider range of inventors, are they becoming more productive? And the answer is very strongly yes. So, you're, so you are your own guinea pig. Is that <laughs> fair to say? <laughs> Probably that's, uh, that's one way of putting it. So as a result, you know, because this is about 
uh, uh, learning from others, right? Whatever we do, and just, just the way we, we spoke in the earlier session, it's about interacting, and as a result, uh, the more you interact, the better you, you develop a vision. Sometimes it's not enough to know something. It's also about how to implement that idea, and sometimes you, 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 you learn or, or think about new ideas, but some, sometimes you also learn how to implement those ideas, so that's why interaction is extremely key. When we spoke over the phone, you said, oh, Andreas, I'm addicted to work. Why is that? Um, well, uh, life took me to where I am uh, because I worked hard. Uh, but everybody in this room uh, would, would agree with this experience, I think. L obviously, we don't know where we are going to be in 30 years, 40 years. But uh, life comes in phases, right? First, we go to a primary school. We don't know which middle school we are going to go to. We have many different options. But if you work hard in primary school, you go to the best uh, middle school. If you work hard, high school, college, etc. And through this experience, I learned that, you know, if you work hard, you always get to the best bin, and then it becomes an addiction. Um, so, and, and uh, after, after so many years, um, I think hard work paid off, and, 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 and that's what I'm enjoying right now. In the name of science, keep going with it, but not to the point where you crumble, right? Okay, so just, <laughs> just keep it below. Now, when you look at all the achievements in your life up until now, which is the one you're most proud of? Two achievements, I would say. One of them is thanks to these uh, a lot of interactions, I accumulated uh, a lot of uh, beautiful friends, uh, which uh, I very much rely on uh, on an everyday basis. So uh, that's that, that's an, an extremely important achievement for me. And the second one, I think, is is the group of students that I. Uh, produced, I would say, uh, both at the undergraduate level, thousands of students, and now at the PhD level, now uh, I have uh, almost 20 students who is going to graduate soon, and now they are going to the world and they are contributing to science, to our knowledge, and I couldn't be prouder when I see them uh, deliver. Okay. Now, we're adding to the, li to, to the list of issues to deal with, maybe even to the problems, because you're going to get one and a half million euros to spend. Now, how to spend that wisely? One of the core questions, how do we use resources? And you're very lucky. You're very lucky because we have one person in the room who's going to be extremely helpful with that. And his name is Professor <laughs> Rein Grob. Please on stage, Professor Grob. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Good to have you. <laughs> you can grab your microphone quite close to the mouth. Thank you. Now, yeah, I'm um, very uh, good at spending money. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That's good to know. Now, for the record, you're president of the Halle Institute for Economic Research and member of the Leibniz Association. And my understanding for the Division of Labor is you get the prize and you hand the money to, to <laughs> Professor Grob and he, he, he recycles it in the German economy. <laughs> Not, not quite. It is indeed the case that we get the money. That's just how the prize works. But then, of course, we uh, Ufuk decides essentially how it's spent. Um, and uh, um, we are just trying to help him navigate the German bureaucracy in what you can and what you cannot do. For example, when hiring people or uh, spending money in certain ways. There's, um, as you know, in Germany, there are plenty of rules to follow. And, and we are trying to help him implement uh, his prize money most efficiently. So how do you plan to spend it? Uh, well, uh, actually, Ufuk should, yeah. should answer that, but I, I can answer for him here in this case, I think. Um, so he's going to have a research group of six uh, PhD students. Uh, we have advertised those positions already. Um, and indeed, we, the advertisement closed uh, a few days ago, I think. And uh, the applicants are very impressive. We have to see whom we can hire. Ufuk has already hired somebody who is already at the institute. So he's hired somebody for the team um, who is already working for the Halle Institute. So uh, economic research, as I explained, now we are trying to combine micro data with theory and computer simulations. So this is really an involved task. So we are talking about really millions of observations in the data. We are talking about general equilibrium model that takes a lot of effort to solve. Then we are putting this into computer. So this really requires a very solid team, a team effort. So that's why I have a, a, a team of brilliant students in Chicago already, more than 10 students. And now we are going to replicate a similar system here in Halle. 
and so hopefully uh, through also online interactions, online seminars, weekly seminars, this group will work as a one single family and uh, uh, share their findings on a, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Reint, I understand you recommended UFOC for this price. No, no um, um, that's not how it works. I mean, the, <laughs> I did not recommend him for this price. Uh, Philippe Aguillon recommended him for the price, a very famous economist. Um, and then uh, after being recommended for the price, UFOC had to essentially find a host. Uh, and he could have picked any any university or institution in Germany, and he just decided to pick the institute, and that's how the connection arose. Now we knew each other already. Yeah. Uh, he had spent time at the institute, done research at the institute. He is in the scientific advisory board of the big network that we are coordinating in Europe on productivity, um, and so the choice I think was very natural for him. Uh, and of course, this is a very lucky break for the Institute to be able to work with somebody like him for such an extended period of time on this scale. So it's a, it's a big project. Very good. Now, Ufok, a personal question towards the end of our quick chat on stage. When you look back, you talked about your greatest achievements. What is the greatest regret you have in life? Oh. <laughs> well, that's a tough one. Uh... I can answer. <laughs> Well, uh, obviously, I'm very grateful to what I've achieved, but uh, unfortunately, uh, that much work didn't leave enough time to invest in uh, other activities. So I regret that uh, I couldn't invest enough time into music and playing an instrument. But luckily, uh, my cousin Joanna is a fabulous uh, pianist who is with us tonight. So uh, luckily, we have somebody in the family doing that. So I feel less bad. Excellent. Well, since, since Joanna is here, do we want to hear her play later on? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Good. You probably will have to spontaneously play the piano, and of course this was not rehearsed or planned in at all. All right, now, big hand again for Ufok, and time to... Thank you so much. Fine. And now it is time to hand the certificate to Ufok. Please accept our apologies. We didn't bring the one and a half million in cash today. <laughs>